terms of the relationship. You start to do business together. And there's no spell out terms of relationship. Anything can happen as long as it's man. The only person that can be consistent is God. So it requires covenant. Is somebody with me at all? Now? And so what God said to me is going to be doing during this conference is going to be calling your attention to higher level. There are things you have seen in God, but there are greater things God will be taking you to during and after this conference. Some of you will begin to experience some strange operations of God in your life like never before. In the name of Jesus Christ. So what we are doing all through this conference and all the speakers will be doing is to be steering the water, showing you from different dimensions and different angles the different kinds of aspect of life where covenant work is required with God. And that's why each day has a direction. For today is a covenant day of glorious family. So walking in the covenant of glorious family. I'd like you to join me in the book of Psalm 68. Psalm 68. And look at something about her God. Psalms chapter 68 and verse 6. There is something about this God. Psalm 68 verse 6. In fact, let me, let me, let me, let me pick from verse 5. Psalm 68 from verse 5 so you get it. Look at how he described it. A father of the fatherless and a defender or judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. Verse 6. Hmm. God set the solitary in families. God, he puts solitary, men who are alone, men who do not have companions, men who do not have helpmates, men who are just alone in their world. He sets the solitary in family. This statement is one key statement that is so deep and broad that explains what God's stance is when it comes to family life. In Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says God looked at man and he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. It wasn't good for him to be alone. And God said, I will make him a helper suitable for him. And what did God do? God set him in a family. He put him in a setting. And that's why in the book of Isaiah, I think 38 there about, he says, search the scriptures. And he began to mention the animals, the old, the beast, and all of that. He says, search the book of the Lord. Say, none of these animals will lack a meat. And you remember Jesus told us that if God does anything for animals, it's a statement of faith that God cares more for us than animals. Let's, let's get there. Let's get there. Let's look at it very quickly. Isaiah chapter 34. I think it should be verse 16. Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Are you there? Let's read from verse 15. There shall the great all make a nest and lay an arch and gather under a shadow. There shall vultures also be gathered. Everyone with what? Eh? Everyone with what? Animals. Animals. Verse 16. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord. Go and check what God has written. Seek out of the book of the Lord and read it. 
No one of these shall fail. None shall want a meat. For you to understand that this is a standard covenant rule. For my mouth it had commanded. And his spirit had gathered. In other words, God has spoken it. And by supernatural operation, it must become a reality. This night, I'm going to set you to pray. But before I set you to pray, I want to give you the foundations, some of the key elements to put together to expect a glorious life and have a covenant of glorious family, family life with God. It is very possible. And the scriptures are laden with it. One, God himself wants glorious family. Why does God need glorious family? Because it is through such glorious families that God can continue his agenda on the earth. God is a generational God. It's not a God that starts and ends with you. It's a God that wants to start with you and then continue with you and continue with your children and continue with your children's children. That is why God gave us that prototype in Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I showed you yesterday. God made a covenant with Abraham. But he didn't go back to make another one with Isaac. Hello? It was the same covenant that God made with Abraham that was activated on Isaac, that was activated on Jacob. Each one in his generation. Because that was a family line that was available for God to prove what he wants to prove. So in Genesis chapter 17 that we read yesterday, we saw how God said to Abraham. He said, Abraham, this covenant, I will establish it with you. And I will establish it with your seed. In other words, God is looking for a seed in a family. What is the meaning of a seed? God is looking for something in the family that can be passed on, that God can brood on. God is looking for something in a family that can be passed on. That's why it's not just a biological baby. Are you following me at all? He said, not all our seed of Abraham that came out of the loins of Abraham. But the seed of Abraham, those Ones who have the substance. There is that substance. That substance is what is compressed together in Christ Jesus. That's why Jesus is called the seed of Abraham. And guess what? What you swallow is Jesus. Is that seed that you swallow. That's why you can become a child of Abraham in the spirit. God is looking for seed. In Malachi chapter 2, where God said, I hate divorce. He said, because I look for holy seed. I look for seed that is holy. I look for seed that are not corrupted. Are you following me, Antona? And children are carriers of seeds. Hello? That's why children are called fruit of the womb. What are they called? Because they are, where do you find seed? You find seed inside a fruit. Are you following me, Antona? So God wants a family that can preserve holy seed so that the seed can move from one generation to another generation. Why? God is in need of seeds to continue his assignment. Because the strategy is that as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest will not cease. If God can find a seed in a man, he can get a plantation on the earth of human beings that will be okay. Are you following me at all? That's why in another dimension, God wants you to be a seed for him anywhere you find yourself. So that through you, there can be multiplication. There can be multiplication of good through you. Let's come back to where we are. So God has an intention 
He wants to be fully represented on the earth. And it is human beings that will represent him on the earth. Human beings carrying out his agenda. Human beings that will belong to him. Human beings that will be God's property in and out. God's kind of people. So those people will be God's kind of family. Are you following me at all now? That's what the Bible says in the book of Ephesians. It says, it's God from whom all the families of the earth derive their source. But not all the family of the earth kept attached, kept attached to him. So God is looking for a people that will be his own. And it starts with families. Find a man, then looks for a mate for the man. Bring the man and the woman together. And then the two of them are made one. And then God wants from the two of them, he wants seeds to harvest. Are you following me at all? And that's why who you marry matters to God. Are you following me here? Who you marry matters to God. Either you're a man or you're a woman. Who you marry matters to God. Because God is looking for seeds that are useful. He's looking for seeds that he can move on. If who you marry is not connected to God, you have to be connected to God because the, the seed has to be cleansed. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. The Bible says if a woman marries, if a brother or a sister marries an unbeliever, if the unbeliever is not giving you trouble, he says stay with him, stay with her. He said for your own faith will then cleanse that man. Otherwise, your seed will not be poor, pure. So which means, what, where God's eyes is on, is still the seed matter. Let's look at it quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Are you there? First Corinthians chapter seven. Um, okay, from verse thirteen. And the woman which had an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is what. Are you there? For the unbelieving husband is what? Sanctify what? And what? And the unbelieving wife is what? Otherwise. Otherwise. I can't hear you. Otherwise. Otherwise. Oh, you are, you are not getting it. Otherwise, the children will not be clean. There will be so much issues. That God will have to be dealing with. Those of us who came from families that our father and our mother are not born again. You know what you have to deal with. To get you saved. Even after you are saved, you know the things that you have to deal with. Because what God is looking for is holy seed. And, and those of you who are here, who you probably have a brother or a sister or yourself and married to somebody who was an unbeliever. And, you know, at the time of ignorance, this scripture should be deliverance enough. Are you following me at all now? God just needs someone who will be there and ensure that the seed is okay. Let me show you. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. Let's quickly see something. Malachi chapter 2. Are we there? Malachi chapter 2. i like us to read verse 15. And did not... Okay, let me read from verse 14. I think that may make sense a little. From verse 14. Yet ye say, whereof, because the Lord had been witness between thee and thy wife, and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treasurely, yet she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. So you see that there is covenant in marriage. 
the wife of thy covenant. What is it about that covenant of marriage? Verse 15. And did not he make the two of you one? Give me amplified so that it makes sense. Give me an amplified. This is verse 15. And did not God make you and your wife one flesh? Quoting what Jesus said. Quoting what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 2. Did not one make you and preserve your spirit alive? And why did God make you one? Finish it for me. Why did he make them one? Why did he make them one? Church, please respond. Are we together? Why did he make them one? He sought a godly offspring. So you see two things very clear in the covenant of family life. Number one is companionship. And we have dwelt too much on companionship. That people have lost sight of this number two. Number two is that God is looking for godly seed. He's looking for seed. Seed that are complete. Seed that are rounded. Seed that are balanced. Children that have been thoroughly brooded upon that they just hit the ground running. Many of us, because of the family we came from, God had to start panicking us. There are all kinds of abnormality in our lives that God first needs to remove for us to now even start to run our race. And that's why you must never fail to stay in this covenant of glorious family with God. So that you can give God what God is looking for. Is somebody with me at all? The ultimate that God is looking for is, can I, get, can I get people who will offer me seeds, offsprings, children that will come out of their union that I can use. Useful children. Godly children. Children that, that God will not have to go through so many stress because they would have done their job. Are you following me at all? One of the greatest failure before God is failure over children. Check your scriptures. One of the greatest failure that gets God irritated is failure over children. That you fail to do the needful over children. Because what you have simply done is to destroy the seed that God can use in another generation. Meanwhile, God is looking for holy seed, godly seed from you so that he can have an harvest of seed that he will plant into every another generation. Every generation needs God's instruments. And God's instruments, they come from somewhere. They must be seeds that are processed somewhere. For that reason, because God knows that biological families fail sometimes. That's why God established spiritual families. So he told us in the book of Psalm 68, he said, he sets the solitary in family. Some children are born and they are solitary, they are alone. No father touch, no mother touch, no body is brooding upon them. And so God will have to look for a family to hide them. So that they can be brooded upon to come out as holy seeds. That's why God is everly looking for parents that will serve his intention. So when you talk about a glorious family, you therefore are talking about three things. Number one, you are talking about the couple. Number two, you are talking about their children. Number three, you are talking about dysfunctional couple. And I want to deal with the three. Because God made provisions for all. There is nobody in the scripture, I mean in life, that God does not make provision for. Including those who are damaged. If we know what is the provision, then we can walk in the covenant that is available. Somebody say amen. amen. So let's start with the first one. The couple. The husband and wife. 
God knows that many things he has to do in a life must be transgenerational. So you cannot do anything transgenerational as an individual. It is impossible for one man alone by himself, without a family, without other support system, to do anything transgenerational, it is impossible. Why? You will always need a seed for the next generation. And so somebody has to be incubated. There has to be a partner. There has to be helpmates that must be incubated to have a seed for the next generation. Are you following me at all now? So in a family setting, I mean, sorry, in, 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 in the journey of life, a person starts out as a single person. And as a single person, the Bible says God looked at man and said it's not good for him to be alone. It's not good for him to be alone. And then he, God, sought for him a help suitable for him. In this meeting tonight and throughout this conference, one of the things God has shown me will be settled is somebody's marital life. Are you following me at all now? That God will settle you with your partner so that this time next year we will celebrate your union. I can hear a beautiful amen. I said this time next year we will celebrate that you are settled in the name of Jesus. Because you will hear God and there will be a release of grace for you to enter into a union that will bring glory to God. In the name of Jesus. Isaac was alone. Getting to 40. And the father said, this, this can be. The guy couldn't find a wife around. No wife around. And he was getting to 40. So the father who understood the covenant that he was in. Called his servant and said, go and look for a wife for my son. You know, that was the first time we are hearing that a man is looking for a wife for his son. Because before that time, everybody gets a wife by himself. And guess what? Isaac would have also gotten a wife by himself. But Abraham understood that the covenant of family life that he had with God is a glorious family life. So you can't just marry anyhow. So he called his servant. He said, come. Go to so, so, so place. Go and look for a wife for my son. He can't marry these girls. Why couldn't he marry them? Oh, they will corrupt the seed. They will finish the seed. That's why you say, hey, how can they be discriminating? They say you cannot marry. No, 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 no. I don't like, I don't like when pastor says you cannot marry and believe I marry. Ah, you don't understand. It is that there is a seed that must be preserved. Otherwise, it will be corrupted. So it cannot go with the blessing to the next generation. Am I am I talking to somebody here? So there must be cautious. Carriage of the seed. It cannot be carried anyhow. Let me tell you. When people say, eh, eh, there's nothing wrong with a Christian marrying a Muslim. There's nothing wrong with a Christian marrying an unbeliever. It's a lot of double work in case you don't know. If you marry at a time of ignorance, a different ballgame. If God specifically gives you an instruction. And I must tell you. There are few individuals that God can give. And don't say God told you when God didn't tell you. I tell people, on the issue of marriage, don't tell me you, God said, when you have not had God about your personal life on small, small things, you've not had God tell you to pray, and then he comes to meet you in prayer. You've not had God on other little things. Now you now want to tell me you had God on, pray, on marriage. Yeah. But I'm saying that God can say to people, to marry someone that looks like an unbeliever. Because God knows what he's about to do with them. Are you following me at all now? God is plotting something. 
and is working out something, and so he could ask somebody that he knows. If you, if you are going to ask Governor Fayoshe's wife, how come she married him? You will hear a story. But you will see a woman who knows her place, and she's able to moderate the process because God is somewhere. For those of you who probably have read the story of Adewale Ayuba, he met his wife. The wife was a Christian. He was a Muslim. And God led the wife to marry. And the wife kept showing him the way until he gave his life to Christ. So God knew the end from the beginning. That's why he gave the lady the liberty. Now, I'm saying all of these things because God cannot be boxed to a corner. However, because that's what some sisters will hear. That's what some what I would say as ah, Pastor, my case is like Adiwali Ayuba's case. <laughs> so that you don't get yourself into pains that are unnecessary. Be sure it's God. Be sure it's God. Don't, don't just let love blind you because you can get into trouble. So Abraham said, Look, my son can't find anybody here. Why? We are in a covenant with God of a glorious marriage. So we can't marry anyhow. That's where it starts from. The covenant of glorious marriage starts from the decision of a partner. You can't marry just anybody. Are you following me at all now? And whenever you are going to make a decision, God has to be involved in the process. You can't just say, I like her face. I like her nose. I get in. It has to be God-directed, God-led from the beginning. So Abraham said, you will now go and get my wife, my son, a wife. And then the servant said, what if I get there and I can't find? Abraham said, no, it's not possible. The God who I serve, that, that angel before whom I've walked all my life, he is going to go ahead of you. And it will lead you to find somebody. How do you ask somebody to go to a place that he doesn't know? And he will get a wife. It's only when you know you are in a covenant with the God that is controlling situations. Say, I know. I know him. So you go. It is his own business to lead you. But looking around here, there is nobody, no lady. And there are so many ladies in Canaan at that time. Say, but there is no lady that fits to the frame. The seed that must be carried by Isaac, my son, is not just anybody, not just any womb that can carry it. You will go far. Then he went. And then God began to guide him. And you know what, what, what the servant of Abraham said? He said, blessed be God who has not left my master destitute of his mercy. Blessed be God, who has not left my master not having God's mercy on him. Because when it comes to the covenant of glorious family life, there must be some element of mercy. That's why the Bible says, He that findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor from the Lord. And favor is a product of mercy. Now, you have not done anything special. God just chose to have mercy on you and give you someone that is shooting to what he wants to do. And it wasn't only Abraham that did that. When it was time for Jacob to get married, Isaac rose up. And I wondered why Isaac didn't say a word when Esau was marrying Esau just, woke, just stood up. He didn't ask his father, what covenant are we in? He didn't, he didn't look before leaping. He just jumped into marriage. Just look for any of the girls there and just married. Is somebody with me at all? But, but Isaac said to Jacob, thank God for his wife, who reminded him anyway. And Rebecca reminded him and said, look, don't let my son marry any nonsense from this place. Oh. Ah, he said, I remember, I remember. So he called his son. He said, you will go to your mother's family. That's the area where they get me a wife that time. You are not getting something here. He remembered how his father went about it. Say so you go there. 
He said, because you can't marry here. The covenant that we carry is anti-nonsense girls. You saw her in club and you go after her. You say it doesn't matter. It will soon matter when it matters. Is somebody with me at all? So you can't get in here. And, and I'm saying to you, every one of you that is gradually becoming fathers, those of you who have given birth, and those of you who are already getting, gotten married and trusting God that you will, all this ideology that I am a liberal man, I don't care. Ah! You will finish your destiny. There's no liberality there. Covenant of glorious family life requires a watch. It requires what? Ah, the ladies that will marry my sons, I'll scrutinize. No, I won't be harassing anyhow, but you see, I'm going to be, and, and thank God I have a wife who, is, who can pray nonsense away. <laughs> She can't pray any nonsense away. So once she, the relationship is not in good one, she will just go on her face and pray. I will scrutinize. And you say, why? Oh, you know, out of the carelessness of our parents, many of them use cultural standards to intervene in marital decisions of their children. But really, Parents should be involved, but the involvement should be biblical. Helping children to understand that they are covenant carrier. If you're a covenant carrier, your children must understand that they are covenant carrier. They can't just bring anybody home. Are you following me at all? No? They can't just bring anybody home. Not because you are going to be a difficult father, but because you understand what God is looking for is holy seed. God is looking for generational seeds that are useful. And you cannot afford that your children will bring in someone that cannot give God the kind of seed that he's looking for. So Isaac said to Jacob, you can marry here. No. You go for it. The same thing his father told the servant when they were going to get him a wife. He told him too. Said, the God of my father will go with you. Order your steps. And exactly the same way they got a wife for his father. The guy went to get water. Jacob went to get water. The woman fell the camel. The wife fell the camel. Did you get the concept? God simply trying to say, you know, he's trying to help us to see that the standards are the same. You will see the pointers on the way. First woman was kind. Second woman was kind. Different generation. But they carry something in their DNA that shows the kind of woman that can be. It's not just any woman. And in the same way, it's not just any man. Otherwise, there will be trouble. So the first thing is, as a single, you need to know that God wants to set you in a family life. Bring you a wife, bring you a husband, that together you will serve the will of God and also give God offsprings that God can use. Children that will last you and they will serve the will of God in their generation. Every time I read the story of Eli, the story of Samuel, the story of Moses, I have pain. I, I challenge you to go and read the story. You will know the pain of a man not marrying right. A man not marrying within the confines that is required. Is someone with me at all? Where were, where were the mother of the children of Samuel? Where was the wife of Samuel? When those children were misbehaving. Where was the wife of Eli? Permit me to do a Bible quiz. What's the name of the wife of Eli? 5,000 awaits you. Hello, Mrs. Eli. <laughs> 
But have you noticed that there is no single woman that is important to divine agenda that his name is not found? Not one. You will never find a woman who is important to divine agenda whose name is not mentioned. How come that the names of these women were not mentioned? Foot for thought. So for God, the marital issue is something serious. But listen, you can be in a covenant with God and you will marry well. Yeah. There is something of such. Once you know this is what is available, the dictates of that covenant is that you can't just make a decision. No matter how old you are, how pressured you are, you can't just make a decision. He has to make the decision. Because the covenant bond that established marriage says God brought the woman to Adam. Adam didn't go by himself. God brought. Oh yes, I know that you want to tell me that the Bible says that finding a wife, finding a good thing. But don't also forget, the Bible says inheritances are given by parents. He said, but a good wife is a gift from the Lord. So it's God that can help you to find. If you try to find by yourself, you'll be in trouble. If you find by how handsome the guy is, you're in trouble. You find by how pretty she is, then shoot. God has to lead you. Is somebody with me at all? God has to what? And this night, because what God asked me to do is after I do all of my presentation, I'm going to allow you to pray. And God told me it will speak to you. It will speak to you tonight on issues about your family life. So my job is to give you clear insight and then we'll bring on. So let's move from just being single. So those who are married, when you are married, that covenant continues to work and that covenant wants to produce children. Oh, I love this. You know, one of the things about this covenant is that it says none shall be barren amongst you. None shall be barren. And I don't care what the enemy tries to do. God, let God be true. Let the devil be a liar. Are you following me at all? No? People had given birth at old age before. The other day I was still hearing of a 58 or so, 58 or 59 year old woman just give birth. Some three years or so ago, or two years ago, a 60 something old woman was carried in the news, gave birth. God is still in the business of breaking the normal record. Medical record can be broken because he's God. Are you following me at all now? And one of the things with God is that if a man can understand the covenant, you can bypass the process. You remember that Anna didn't have a child. And the truth is that Anna would have died childless if she didn't understand how this thing works. God was looking for a godly seed. Anna was looking for a competitive child. Anna was looking for a child with which to compete with his uh, competitor. But God was looking for only seed. If God had given Anna a child before Samuel came, Anna would have been so possessive and would have ruined the life of that child. Meanwhile, in Evan's agenda, the child that Anna was going to give birth to, the first child that was going to break that womb must be a prophet dedicated to the Lord. But Anna was looking for a baby to show Penina that me too I get shy. And for a long time, no baby was coming. And you know the irony of it? No prophet came to tell her anything. No prophet came to tell her anything. She was herself 
who discovered something must be wrong here. And then went to the temple. And then began to pray at Shiloh. And said, give me a child. Let's enter into a covenant. You give me a child. I give him back to you. Ah! God said, So you just got it. And then God said, that's not a problem. A child you have. Because what I'm looking for, you have come into a league with me. Listen, don't cry to God looking for a child just so that so the society will not say you are barren. Doesn't work. God, give me one. And I give him back to you. Are you following me at all? And when you are already in a service covenant with God, when you are already in a, a covenant league with God, that you have made a covenant that your generation will serve God. That one is another kettle of fish. That one you will discuss with God for a right. The Bible says about Isaac. The Bible says the womb of his wife was short. So which means she probably was not meant to give birth. And Isaac entreated God. Isaac spoke with God. Isaac had a dialogue with God concerning his wife. And the Lord was entreated. The Bible says, and the Lord listened to him. Hiya! So a man of covenant, in the place of prayer, when it comes to asking for children, it's a powerful priest. Come and say powerful priest. A man who has said, God, I will serve you, but not only me, my generations will serve you. Listen, people confuse church attendance with being in a walk with God. You can come to church and be more present than the church rats. And have no connection with the living God in terms of covenant relationship. God is not looking for your attendance of church. Attendance is important, but that's not what he's looking for. There is something that sponsors church attendance. And that's that you are in a league, a covenant relationship with God. You are in a relationship with God that denotes, Lord, dead or alive, this guy is for you. Dead or alive, it doesn't matter what it is. I'm saying to you, you have a man on the earth. Let everybody on the earth be idol worshiper. There is a man here in me saying to you, I will serve you. I will serve you, Lord. I will serve you, Lord. I pledge. To you, all of my days, I will serve, I will serve you, Lord. 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 And I pledge to you, I pledge to you, all of my days. You know the reason why God will have to give you a child? Because he already said it in the covenant package. He said, through you and your seeds shall the families of the earth be blessed. Through you. In other words, God is looking for a situation where your life will bless people. And after you, your children will take over in their generation to bless their world. Can you see why a man in covenant with God cannot lack seed? If you understand how to press the button. Abraham said to God in Genesis chapter 15, 
What will you give me seeing that I go childless? God says, shut up. You can't. You can't. And let me help you to see it this way. God sometimes can give you physical children and he can also give you spiritual children. Are you following me at all? Not, not sometimes. He will even give you spiritual children. Because by all means, you will have someone after your order that can carry on your legacy. It is forbidding that a man of covenant lacks someone to carry on his legacy. It's forbidden. Because the covenant dictates, requires that after you, somebody must carry the seed. A seed shall praise him and it shall be counted for a generation. Is somebody with me at all? Now? It's part of the covenant package. God said, no, 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 no. You can't go childless. So me, me, you are in covenant with me. You will go childless. Mba, you don't understand. I need your seed. And that's why, can, can I be honest with you? That's why you can afford to play and joke with your relationship with God. It affects everything. It affects everything. So let me deal with the third category, then I tie it all up. Those are people whose marriages just crash for whatever reason. And the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that we just read. He said, I think in verse 16 thereabout. Is it 16 or 17? He said, if the unbelieving man does not like to stay with you, if the unbelieving woman does not want to stay with you, he said then, divorce. Allow the person to go. Now, you see, people don't understand that place. It doesn't mean that that's the, the person is the one that will go and make the divorce. The person can be behaving in a way that he doesn't want to stay. I was involved in a particular matter and, and they were telling me, this couple, they have lived for, to, in the same house for three years. They don't talk to one another. The man goes out with another woman. Carry all that woman and says, he's not interested again. But just for social reason. That's why he has not gone to divorce. And told the woman, if you want to go, you can go. I'm, I'm done with you. And then somebody said to me and said, um, as a counselor, you advise a person to go and buy uh, what the vibrator. So that the person can, the woman can use to satisfy herself. I said, that is complete nonsense. You are just leading her from sin to sin. That marriage is as good as gone. As you sit down, everybody go their way. Give me that scripture and you'll see. That's not a scripture that people divorce on every, just every reason. No. But I'm trying to help you to see that it is available there. First Corinthians chapter 7. Give me verse 17 there about. Is 17 or 18. Please give it to me quickly, my dear. I need to lead people to pray. What are you giving me here? Okay. No. Is this, what did we quote there the other time? I think First Corinthians 7, 20, oh sorry, it's not, uh, no, it's, 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 um, okay, it's, it's 15, 15, sorry. 15. 15. First Corinthians 7 15. Now you will give it to me. Do you have TPT? Give me TPT if you have TPT. Quick, 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 quick. Yeah, can we read together? But if the unbelieving spouse wants a divorce, then, eh? Eh? In this, uh-huh. 
Eh? Are we reading the Bible? Read on. In other words, why will you be in a marriage that you are not, your mind is not at rest? Three years, four years, the man has already gone. Are you following me at all now? Uh huh. Now, but this is where I'm going because that's not my, the focus of my discussion. This is where I'm going. There are people and, and the church who have not been very fair on our brothers and sisters who are believing the, 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 the they are, they are tongue-talking, spirit-filled brothers and sisters, but for one reason or the other, sometimes it could be their carelessness, sometimes it could be the stubbornness or hardness of the men that they marry, and they find themselves in this situation. The Bible says God has not called them to bondage. Are you following me at all? He's it's not called them to stay there and remain bound. They are not happy. Their lives are draining out. No, that's not what he called them to. He called us to peace, to enjoy the best of our life serving him. Okay, so when a person is in that state, how does this covenant work for that person? Oh, I'll tell you, it does. Because it's that covenant that works for widows and widowers that works for these people in this situation. I'll take you back to the story of Naomi. You remember Naomi? Now means husband was dead. The children were dead. But Naomi was a covenant woman. Hello? Naomi was what? A covenant woman. Now listen, even if things went bad, they can be alive again. They can be alive again. And so what God simply did was from that place where things went bad, you know, he didn't, she didn't have any son. But God stirred up the heart of Ruth. Now, I don't believe that it was Ruth alone that decided. There was a divine involvement. God stirred up the heart of Ruth. And Ruth said to her, where you go, I go. Where you settle, I settle. In other words, Ruth was saying, I enter into your covenant. And Ruth was also a widow. And then God taught us a powerful lesson. Two, I mean, two powerful lessons in that story. One for Naomi. The other one for Ruth. Because Ruth said, your God will be my God. God said, ah, ah, you touch an area that I will never fail to respond. Though you are broken, you are battered, your husband is gone, I can bring about restoration. And that's exactly what God did. Naomi, in her own case, said, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. You see, my life has been made bitter. God, God has dealt with me terribly. My husband is gone. Even if I have to marry today, will I have children? I will. God said, you don't understand. I can make you laugh again. And guess what? That child was christened after Naomi's order. God ensured that that child has a connection to Naomi. When you go to the genealogy of Jesus, you will still see the story there. What was God saying? Even the dead tree can still live. He that is joined to the living has hope. Because some of us Christians, we don't even know how to present the hope that is in the gospel to our brothers and sisters who are divorcees. The fact that they are divorcees doesn't mean their life has finished. There is a God that has provisions to take care of everybody, provided you will key into the covenant provisions. And one of the areas God answers them and helps them is over their children. Some of them is that God will give them another man that will, that will bring about the restoration. Some of them is that God will brood upon their children. They may have one, and that one may be a mighty oak. Are you following me, Atona? And so if you know anyone who is divorced, or anyone who is in this auditorium, or anywhere listening to me, divorced, and then probably you have a child, or you have a child out of wedlock, and then the devil tells you your life is finished, it's a lie. 
When you are connected to this covenant, there is a God who comes on the scene and makes you to laugh. And guess what he does? He turns your seed to a seed that can bless. And that's why you see some women, they say their husband left them. Or they say, oh, they gave birth to this child. That's the only child when they were young. And then they labored and all of that. And somehow God makes the child to become a mighty giant. Mighty orc. Because they put their confidence in God. Friends, when a man is conscious of God, give me Psalm 128. That's where I want to lead you to pray. Because tonight, God will brood upon you for a generational blessing. Amen. Psalm 128. Psalm 128. Hear the covenant blessing. Psalm 128. Please make that fast. It's not TPTs. TPTs doesn't have Psalm 128. It's KJV. KJV. Psalm 128. Can we? Can we read? Blessed. Is the way you didn't center it. Center it, please. You have caught something there. Blessed is. As, wait. Can somebody more of this thing get on that thing? Okay, pick your Bible. Let's let's not wait for these people so that they don't they don't steal out of my time. Can you pick your Bible quickly? Psalm 128. Let's read from the beginning. Ah, thank God. Psalm 128 from Wazon. Blessed is everyone that feared the Lord, that walked in his ways or his covenant. Blessed is everyone. No, stay me there. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll keep moving, but just stay me there for now. Blessed, in other words, there is a supernatural release of power upon everyone. Who chooses to be conscious of God and decides to walk in the covenant that is prescribed? So what happens to them? Next. For that man, thou shall eat the labor of thy hands. Happy shall thou be. That's a good point to say amen. And it shall be well with thee. Amen. Next verse. Thy wife. You can also slash his husband. Did you get it now? Thy husband. Shall be as a fruitful vine. By the side of of thy house. <laughs> Somebody is not seeing what I'm seeing. It means your spouse, your wife or your husband will not be a non-entity. <laughs> that because of you, you know we saw in that First Corinthians chapter 7, he said, by the faith of the man or the woman, the spouse is sanctified. The person is blessed. So for your sake, say your spouse will be fruitful vine by the side of the house. Thy children like olive plants round about, round. Can you give me this in NLT? Give me in NLT. You know, we have a lot of juice in the word of God that we really don't take time to meditate. Your, your wife or your husband will be like a fruitful grapevine flourishing within your home. 
Your children will be like vigorous young olive tree as they sit around. Let, let me explain what olive tree is. Olive tree is an expensive tree. It brings forth what they used to do olive oil. Are you following me at all now? It's, it's a tree that is in its own kind. And what God is saying here is that you will have children that are productive. The outcome of their productivity will be expensive. Do you know when your when your children you have three, you have four, you have two of them, and they are mighty on their own. When they come around you, the people know that you have children. I saw in the Bible. The Bible says. They will answer the enemy at the gate. Part of the enemy, the answer at the gate is poverty. When you have children like this, they checkmate insults. <laughs> Are you following me at all now? It's a covenant. A covenant of glorious family. That your family will not just be just family, sha. That your family has glory and beauty around them. That's what he's saying. Next verse. That is the lost blessing. <laughs> we are coming back to that verse 3. Next verse. Because we are going down to the last verse. May the Lord continually bless you from Zion. May you see Jerusalem prosper. As long as you live. Can you, can you read this? <laughs> hey! It means that at your old age, as a grandma, they will bring your grandchildren. Are you following me at all now? You won't be spending your years, your grand old age in sickness and in disease. You will have your grandchildren and then you are blessing them. And they are saying, thank God for grandma. Thank God for grandpa. Because God of heaven chooses to do you good. My wife and I were at Bishop Adela Kun's 78th birthday. And they asked his children to come out. And his children came out with their children. And I saw the beauty of that scripture. Four children. Two boys. Two girls. But they also came with their grandchildren. So they were asking the grandchildren to speak. And one of them said, I love grandpa because he buys me this, he does this. Ha! I say, what a blessing. That in your lifetime, in agility, in strength, you sit down and you watch your children's children flourish in your lifetime. Is somebody with me at all now? There is a covenant like that in God. It's the covenant of glorious family. Someone will connect with that tonight. So, my job is done. And in the next couple of minutes, I'll be leading you into prayer. Emmanuel, can you get on the mic for me? I want to hear a worship prayer sound. Rachel, can you follow up? Can I have the keyboard? I want to hear worship prayer sound. Rachel, can you pick the sound first? I like your heart to be set. And let your heart begin to raise to the God of heaven. That you don't want to have just a family. You don't want to have 
an empty and ordinary family. You want a glorious family that stands before the Lord. I don't know where this message meets you. Either as a single that needs to marry well or as a married person that needs your home to start working properly or you need children in that house or you have children and you want to bring them on that, that divine shield that they are in proper alignment whatever your case is can you go ahead and talk to God give it to me can you go ahead and talk to God mm, no that's not what I want to I want to hear a worship prayer song Can you talk to God? Can you talk to God? Make sure your Bible is beside you. Make sure that your prophecy note is beside you because God will be speaking to you. The next 20 minutes is just for you to pray. Just you and God. Just you and God. Just you and God. Lord, I brought my family life before you. The God of heaven and earth. You are a generational God. That you will settle my family according to the order that you did with Abraham. I want my children to stand before you, God, all the days of their life as an instrument in your hands. Give me a child, Lord, and I'll give you a prophet in your house. Give me a husband. Give me a wife for God. And I promise you a home that will serve you. You can stand up if you want. You can walk around if you want. You can kneel down if you want. Take any posture you like. But make sure you are in, in deep communion with Jehovah. the Lord has given to me. We are for signs and wonders in the land.
ahead and tell God, I have come to change the order in my family. Whatever order in my generation, in the past, that does not align with the covenant in Christ, I have come to stand in between to establish a new order in Christ. Starting from me, O oh God, I've come to present to you a family that you can use. I have come to stand between my husband's family and the new order. I have played the blood of Jesus upon my husband. I've come to plead the blood of Jesus upon my wife. I've come to plead the blood of Jesus upon my children. And I am saying, Lord, it's a new order from my life onward for my generation onward. In the name of Jesus, Echo Tire, I have come out from the old order and I'm establishing a new order. He called Nelabosha. fruit of the woman, those who are believing God for a spouse, you come to the altar and continue your prayer. If you are believing God for fruit of the womb, you are believing God for a spouse, you just come to the altar, find a place on the altar to lay and continue your prayer there. Go ahead, go ahead. Just continue your prayer there. Lord, I've come to you. When you are here, when you are here, find a place. When you are here, 
says there is nothing too difficult for you to do. Your children have come to you on this altar this night. You are no respect of any person. Anna came to Shiloh and poured her heart out and you responded Father let it be oh God that according to the circle of life 
let these burdens become testimonies. In the name of Jesus. Every burden that has come to this altar tonight concerning family life. Some of them is marriage. Some of them children. My Father, my God. You that made this covenant with me that you will respond every time I call on you concerning your people. I have joined my faith to be us presenting this request tonight. Oh God, let there be quick response. Let there be supernatural testimonies. For all those who are in our different centers, Ife Oshobo, Lagos, and everyone collecting online whose faith is drawn to this Father, surprise them. By the time we will come next year, let it be an harvest of their testimonies. Let it be an harvest of their own testimonies. Do for them, O oh God, what only you can do as God. We thank you. I hereby declare that in the name of Jesus, those matters that brought you to this altar, they are turned to testimonies. You are coming back with the testimony of supernatural intervention. Whatever need to be torn, whatever need to be rearranged, whatever arrangement heaven needs to make to make this a reality, we command them to be made. In the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Mark today's date because we are coming with testimonies. Rise up to your feet.